Um, hello, my name is Benjamin Brown, and I am. I am the one responsible for creating the One Hour Nerd Collection. Each one of the shows that will be read today are shows that I personally wrote. Um, this is sort of a testing ground. Um, this is the first reading these shows have ever had, and these are not the final drafts of the show by any means. So on the back of your programs, there is this nice little response sheet. Um, and if you would um, fill those out and uh, turn those into that gentleman sitting in the back over there, Alex Cole, um, when we are done with the script readings, that would be wonderful. Um, so, this was my senior honors project, or this is my senior honors project, and um, the main question I was trying to solve with all of the research that I put behind this, and yes, this collection of nerdy parodies does have research behind it, um, <laughs> was um, when it comes to geek culture, are there any true guilty pleasures? So. Hopefully, um, these shows will get you to think about that question. If not, well then, hopefully at least you're entertained. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, let my readers introduce themselves real quick. Uh, so, I'm Jason Edler. I am Shelby Reese. I am Ben Darwin. I am Emily Burton. I'm Amy Quinn. I'm Rebecca Tarr. And I'm Dakota Hager. Um, so, we're going to go ahead and uh, start with the readings of the scripts. Um, after um, the shows have concluded, then um, we'll do the whole clappy thing. Um, my, <laughs> my, my panel will um, ask me some questions, uh, response sheets will be filled in, and then that will be that. Uh, but I will ask you all to uh, hold your applause until after the last show, which is Geeked Out. So, um, without further ado, this is the One Hour Nerd Collection, and we'll be starting off with a show called Sparkles the Manticoon, which is a parody of 90s video games. Simon Smith, age 13, a boy who loves to sit by his television and play his Mienta 36 Triple D. He one day dreams of visiting the land of Technoverse from his favorite game series, Sparkles the Manticoon. Sparkles the Manticoon, age 15, half manticore, half raccoon. This magical little creature can shoot light from his magical ring. Also, he has attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Robo Psychosis, age 47. This mad scientist's ultimate goal is to turn everyone and everything into an evil robot. Princess Hominina, age 19, a beautiful young maiden who rules over Technoverse and is quite prone to cash. The time is a Saturday morning in the early 90s. It starts out in Simon's living room, but immediately switches over to the super futuristic world of Technosphere. The stage is set to include a character <coughs> in a nondescript game in console. Sparkles is on stage, but not hit by the light. Simon is sitting on the couch. Wowie Sally! What a radical little cartoon marathon that was on Cartagus Lodian! I can't believe all the adventures that Dougie Bravo had at recess. Oh, and Lynn and Rippy was a hit today! Man, cartoons are never gonna be this good again! In 20 years, I'm going to completely ignore the cartoons of the day, and insist that these cartoons are the best without actually going back to see how they've aged. It's foolproof! <laughs> <laughs> Holy mock moly, that sounds like it's coming from my Mienta 36 triple D. Spotlight on Sparkles. Mienta, because if you don't play it, who will? Spotlight on. <laughs> Gee willers, I've got to play with it. It's the only way that the room won't explode with 36 bits of intense action. Sparkles is the power button on the game console. The light now encompasses the whole room so that Sparkles is clearly visible. Simon grabs a controller. All right, Sparkles the man to go. Yeah, get that robot. Well, high score! Oh man, sweet cracks! Oh, I wish that it wasn't all a game, though. I wish that I could really be in the world of Technosphere. For real. Your wish is my command. A series of slow flashes. Whoa, what happened? You're in the Technoverse now! Sparkles the Manticoon? Gnarly! But, uh, 
up. Why is my couch of nine Yenta still here? That's no couch, amigo. That's one of Robo Psycho's robots. I'll take care of it. Sparkles pushes the couch off stage. Simon, about to destroy the game system. I'll show you, you evil robot goon! Whoa, little buddy, not so fast there. The 36 Triple D isn't one of Robo Psychiatrist's minions, and it isn't just a game system either. That little device's triple disc drive is the only thing power enough, powerful enough to get you back home. But what if I don't want to go back home? Don't want to go back home? But if you never leave, you'll never see your family again, and there's nothing more cool than family. What? No way. Family is super lame. Well, you obviously haven't seen any of the Sparkles the Manticoon one-hour cartoon collection. At the end of each 10-minute adventure, I do a segment called Sparkles Says, where I tell my viewers all the morals that they should have learned from watching me. Well, I, I did watch the cartoon, only I just usually skip those segments. You've got a lot to learn, kid. That's why I'm taking you under my wing. I mean tail. I mean claw. <laughs> I mean, let's focus on the task at hand. <laughs> Which is? The princess thinks that you're so great she wants to throw you a special ceremony. <coughs> well, a special ceremony? That sounds like the perfect time for Dr. Robopsychosis to swoop in and grab the princess. We've got to hurry. What? That would never happen, not in a million light years. The princess is tough enough to take on the Robo Spike Cider, no problem. But wasn't she captured at the meteor shower ceremony? She was distracted by all the meteors. What, what about when Robopsychosis caught her through the chimney on Christmas? There's no Christmas in Technosphere. It's Holidalia ceremony. Also, she was just sleeping too close to the fireplace. Everyone does that. Okay. So then how do you explain when she got snatched up at the annual Undersea Robo Prom? Well, that was all a matter of venue, really. I wanted to have it in Undersea City Zone 6, but would the planning committee listen? No. Anyway, I don't think we've got anything to worry about regarding Robo Siamese twins, but you're right. We should hurry, because otherwise, they might run out of Taco Central's real chicken breast burritos. The two keep walking for a while. The lights turn off for a second. When they turn back on, Feminina appears. Well, looks like we made it. Wow, Prince of Princess Feminina's invisible palace. I've always wondered what it would look like. Yep. <laughs> She's a beauty, ain't she? Also, the palace is nice. Oh, Sparkles, you're just the goofiest little thing. Oh, shucks. Well, Princess Feminina, oh man, I, I've always wanted to meet you in person. I have a poster of you right above the rocking chair in my bedroom. Well, look who it is. It is an honor to meet you, Mr. Smith. She says, she, she, she shakes hands with Simon. Sparkles, did you realize that Simon here is the best Sparkles player ever? Uh, well, actually, I, I'm pretty mediocre at that. Oh, well, of course I did. He's gotten the highest scores and lost the least lives of anyone who's ever controlled me. Actually, there's a few kids in my neighborhood, neighborhood that know a lot more about that. That's the whole reason why I brought him here. I didn't want the award to go to just anybody. Oh, goody. Let, just let me grab your certificate. It should be in my con. Dr. Robopsychosis bursts in and grabs Feminina. Tainer, someone help me! Foolish fools of tomfoolery. You are no match for me. I will carry your princess back to my techno house, which you'll have to go through eight worlds of intense platforming puzzle action to get to. <laughs> we don't have time for that. Simon has to be back in time for dinner with his family. <laughs> well, it figures you wouldn't think things through, Sparkles. After all, the jungle cats mixed with small bears are nowhere near as smart as people, even when they do have comically large heads. You know that I'm a manticore mixed with a raccoon. You're the one who created me after the Toxic Freak Show lab incident. Oh yeah, I forgot about that spin-off comic series. I didn't think that was canon. Time is running out. <laughs> Sparks and recreation. Soon, Princess Feminina will be hanging on a robot's rope over a robot pit of robot lava. Then, she will be melted down into Feminina goo. Ew. And then put in, then I'll put inside Feminino robots, which will sit on robot thrones and command all of the citizens of Techtoverse to pave the streets with robot gravel. 
Dude, what is your obsession with robots? I'm a one-dimensional character! <laughs> <laughs> Sparkles, get this guy off me! Help! There has got to be some way to defeat this guy. Simon, do you have any ideas? Um, shoot him in the face with your ring three times like you always do? Sparkles aims his ring at robopsychosis in space, causing him to scream. Ah! Whoa, gnarly, where'd you get that idea? Um, like you always do? Ha! You think that you can beat me? Well, you'll have to face the facts. Feminina is going to turn into mush, and so are the two of you. But I'll kill the girl first. It's affirmative action, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Could I interest you in robot's tissue? No, but you can't interest me in two more light beams to your face. Smiles eats his rage twice more. On the second shot, Robopsychosis drops from Anina and falls to the ground. Curses! I hate you, Coop! I'd be careful who you say that around. Thank you for saving me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Sparkle's life ring has disintegrated this trick that I was going to give you. Is there anything else I can do for you or show you? I can think of a few things. I think that one Simon really wants is to go back home to his family. Are you kidding? The Technoverse is so much better than back home. Are you kidding? You didn't learn anything about the importance of family from this? No! What did this have anything to do with family? Well, did you learn anything from this at all? I guess it tested my reflexes or something. <laughs> Sounds good enough to me. Now let's celebrate with some rice balls. Black. All right, so the next show we have coming up is uh, Magical Ninja Aoko-chan, which is a parody of anime, but more specifically, um, Magical Girl anime or anime. Aoko Sakamoto, age 14, part of a Magical Girl trio and a student at the School of Ninja Arts, SNA, Shy Animation. Aburu Kichi, age 13. Aoku's best friend, fellow trio member, and fellow student. Energetic and impatient. Chizume Denwa, age 15, the leader of the trio. Smart and dignified. Daruko Niki, age 15, a male transfer student to the SNA, usually rude to his fellow students, but there's another side of him. Master Ayotawa Einstein, age 35, Aoku's teacher. His lesson plans never seem to go as smoothly as he hopes. Jiu Rima, age 1 million. A strange, maniacal creature from another planet, resembling a small dog. It takes place on a modern Monday at the School of Ninja Arts in Shiyoji, Japan. The stage is set with four small desks, and Aoko, Baburu, Chisame, and Daruko, with a big desk at the front for Master Isaac. All students have rice balls on their desks. Everyone is present, except Daruko. All right, class, welcome back. I hope you all had fine weekends. Now, if you look on your desk, you'll notice I put something special up for you. Ooh, rice ball, so tasty. Oh, I could just eat a whole bucket. Mmm. Baburu puts her rice ball in her mouth and slowly starts to chew it. Oh, wait, Baburu! I didn't tell you to do that. Silly Baburu, you want to wait for the teacher's instructions. <sighs> well, I was going to have you practice the item disguise jutsu with that rice ball, but I suppose that I could go whip up another one. Hold on, and don't cause too much trouble while I'm gone. Exit, Isaac. Babaru, I expected more out of you. We're not just here for nothing, you know. A magical ninja always respects their elders. Isn't that right, Aoko? Aoko sits staring at her rice ball. Aoko. Aoko! Babaru and Tisa may freeze in place for Aoko to address the audience. Hi, my name is Aoko Sakamoto, and this is just another ordinary day at the School of Ninja Arts. I've been studying here for a long time, so that is pretty normal to me. It's normal to everyone here, really. But I bet you're wondering about the magic part. That is actually something completely outside this classroom, and something that I only just recently became involved with. Let me set the scene for you. Aoko gets up in front of the desk. Baburu and Tisa may exit. I was sitting on a hill in front of my house, pondering my destiny when... Enter Tisa may. Hello there. Are you just sitting on a hill in front of your house, pondering your destiny? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. How did you know? Magic mind reading. My name is Chizume Denwa, and I just recently signed to become leader of a squad of magical girls. Magical girls? What does that mean? It's your destiny, Aoko. Just let me tap you with my magic wand, and you'll be instantly recruited into my squad. Wait, how did you know my name? Mind reading again. You can get cool powers, too, if you just trust my wand. 
So if I get powers from your wand, how did you get the wand in the first place? I signed a contract with a mouse creature from another planet. And what did the contract say? I couldn't tell you exactly, but I don't think that there was anything bad in it. I mean, he was pretty cute, so I doubt that there were any harsh policies in there. Here he goes, pokes his head out. Revoke you! <laughs> <laughs> Here he goes, his head. Well, going by logic, I refuse, but going by destiny, I might as well accept. Exit, Chisume. Ayoko addresses the audience again. So that is how I became a magical girl. But what I did not know at the time was that I was the only member other than Chisume. Still, recruiting Babaru was not too terribly hard. We had been best friends for years before that. This is how that went. Enter Babaru. Hey, Oka-chan, I want to do something right now. What are you doing right now? Can I do something right now? Well, I just joined a squad of magical girls and- Magical girls? I want to be a magical girl. Do I get a wrong wand and a cape and a hat and a sword and a cap and a tiara and a dress and- I'll go get Chisume. Chisume enters. Aoko, Babaru, and Chisume go back to the way they were sitting before the flashback. And that's how our mad beautiful trio was formed. Hey, Yoko, are you using your powers to communicate with another dimension again? If you are, that is so cool. I wish I knew how to do that. Hey, Yoko, are you going to teach me, please? I want to know now. Enter Ice and Dragon Girl behind him. Well, I'm back. I made the rice ball, and look at who I found trying to hide in the kitchen. Oh, Naruko, you're so dreamy. How could you say that, Bob Rue? He's super mean. Man. Get your grubby hands off me, old man. I didn't choose to go here. I'll take my hands off you if you decide to go to your desk. <sighs> okay, whatever. Ison lets go and heads to the front desk. Duruko sits in the only empty desk. All right, class, let's get back to our discussion. So, the rice balls in front of you is meant for you to practice the item disguise jutsu on. To perform this trick, all you need to do is focus your energy on the rice ball and... Think about what a, a weapon to play, replace it with without actually visualizing? Yeah, 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 we get the point. Barbaro, how did you do that? Were you reading my mind? I've told you time and time again that magic isn't allowed in the classroom! But Master Eisen, what about jutsus? Jutsus aren't magic! But they both defy the laws of physics, so what makes them different? Jutsus use chi energy that naturally flows through the body. The techniques don't just come from nowhere. But reading minds requires a great deal of energy flowing to your brain. Doesn't that make it a jutsu too? Anyway, <laughs> like Barbara was saying, the item disguised jutsu requires the user to... Daruko throws his rice ball at Aoko. Hey, I would appreciate if you didn't do that. He obviously threw it because he doesn't know how to express his feelings for you. Oh, Aoko-chan, I'm so jealous of you. And that's why the item disguised Jutsu was very influential in the creation of the California Roll. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait just a second. Did I miss something? Aoko, why do you look so hurt? Daruko threw a price ball at her because he likes her. That's not fair. Daruko, is this true? It wasn't a rice ball. It was a rubber shuriken. I was practicing the item disguised Jutsu just like you wanted us to. Well, uh, okay, good job. Uh, don't go, but next time, try to be put along, not a person. Okay? Whatever. Why do you let Darwin treat you that way, Aoko chan Because she has feelings for him, and he has feelings for her, and they're going to get married and live together, have a million, million, trillion babies, and probably get a dog, and... Actually, that's really not why. I guess it just didn't hurt that much. Anyway, check out what's happening to Ice and Sama. The girls watch as Ice and Seize is uncontrollable. <laughs> <laughs> Foolish girls! You will prove a win against the great powers of darkness. <laughs> is that a demon lord possessing Ice? Sure is! All right, girls, you know what to do! Sound cue, cheesy transformation music. <laughs> the girls all dance around gracefully while slipping on tiaras, gloves, and other accessories. This is dumb. I'm out of here. Exit to Ruko. The girls get done changing and the music fades. All right, evil demon lord, you're going down! Funny. I remember the transformation sequence being a lot more exciting than that. Animators aren't paid well. They are. <laughs> what are we doing just sitting here talking? Let's fight! Babaru's right. Let's do this! Chizume points her palm at Ison and opens it up as if to unleash fairy dust on him. MAGIC DUST! Ayoko pushes her hand in front of her as if she were using telekinesis. Psychic push! Bob Rubles ice in numerous kisses. Kiss for age! What? Was that supposed to hurt? 
The forces of good just aren't strong enough to defeat evil. That's the way these things are supposed to work, right? <coughs> evil triumphs over good. What to do now? I know. I think I'll blow up the moon. We can't let them blow up the moon, girls. We need to think of something. Enter Daruko wearing a mask. I have arrived from the shadows. It's Dark Mask! <laughs> <laughs> Who could that dream you love both be? I can't make any logical conclusions about him. You ask me, I think he looks a little like Daruko. What? Don't be silly. That can't be Daruko. He doesn't even look like Daruko. I mean, he's dreaming like Daruko, and he has the same voice as Daruko, and he kind of smells like Daruko, and his mannerisms. Darko. Oh, Dark Mask, what should we do with this beast? Aoko, I want you to look deep into your heart and remember the powers of friendship and love, and then your powers will be restored. Hey, what about the rest of us? Worry not. Let Aoko handle this as she is the hope and the light of the world. But I thought that I wasn't special. Anyone can be special, Aoko. You just have to have pink hair to believe in yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I already need one requirement. Take care, Aoko. And remember to drink your pure lemon. <laughs> Exit Dorito. Oh man, I'm so, so, so jealous! I may be indifferent to dark mask, but I am not indifferent to justice. Ayoko clenches Ison, and he falls to the ground and wakes up with a normal voice. Oh, what happened? You were possessed by a demon lord, but then the magical girl trio saved you. Actually, it was mostly Ayoko. Well, thank you, Ayoko. But, you know, this could have easily been solved with a little juice. Huh? Yes, the having a can of demon repelling spray jutsu. Don't you remember what I gave you your utility belt? Yes, I remember it. It reminded me of... Mother. Oh, Aoko, you're such a card. Everyone laughs, except for Aoko, who just stares blankly in the audience. So, um, at this point, I forgot to say earlier, please make sure your cell phones are off. Um, anyway, we'll be moving on to the third show called um, Manta Man and Remora Boy in Like a Manta Out of Hell. Um, and it is a parody of cheesy, um, 60s superhero shows, like the old Batman show, but there's a, a little twist character that comes in and shakes things up a little. But anyway, I'll just let you see for yourselves. Donald Manta Man Twist, age 30, a dapper billionaire who fights crime dressed as a manta man. This is more boy Jason, age 15, an excitable young man who goes on golf trips with Donald. Secretly, he is fighting crime alongside Donald, Donald dressed as a small fish. <laughs> mayor Joe Hink Hinklich, age 45, the mayor of Grantsville, alerts man to man and remora boy whenever crime occurs. Carmen Dentista Blanca, age 25, a normal dentist by day. By night, she is a super sexy villain uh, packed to the teeth with dental plums. Damien Singe Blackheart, age 40, a muscular demon like anti hero who serves to depress everyone around him. <laughs> Ice cream vendor, age 30. <laughs> it takes place during the 1960s in the day, in the city of Grantsville, right outside the Great Regional Bank. Joan is in, the down is in downtown Grantsville, in front of the Great Regional Bank. Man to man and Remora Boy come running in. They continue to run in place even when they're right next to Joan. Hurry, Remora Boy! The mayor needs our help! I'm hurrying, I'm scurrying, I'm even flurrying, man to man! Well, hurry, scurry, flurry a little faster! To reiterate, the mayor needs our help! Boys! Man-to-man -man and Remora Boy, continue running. Boys! Man-to-man -man and Remora Boy, halt. I'm right here. Jeepers, creepers, peepers! We certainly got here looking split, didn't we, Man-to-Man? -man? We certainly did, Remora Boy, thanks to the lightning chariot in my utility bolt. <laughs> anyway, what's the situation, Mayor? <laughs> it's just awful, Man-to-Man. -man. Some villainous creep left a note that they were gonna rob the great regional bank at 2.30. That's 2.30. Get it? Like a toothache. Who is that, man to man? That voice sounds familiar. Why, that sounds like none other than the sexy Latin samba of... Enter Dentista. Dentista! I don't know me! I am Dentista, and I am about... I need about six and sixteen million dollars capital to buy my new dental equipment. Sixteen million dollars? That's approximately how much money is in the great regional bank. 
What do you think, men's <laughs> men? Should we let her have it? Dentista is a sly barracuda, my lord. Don't you ever forget that. While new dental equipment might seem noble, she's probably trying to buy something crazy like the fluoride bombs or, or a giant dentist drill to dig into the earth's core. That's <laughs> no good, men's man. No good at all. You're right, Ramor boy, but I have a plan. What's that? We beat her up a lot, but first, some witty man. <laughs> Hola, senorita. Uh, senorita. You'll take un caballo blanco muy grande. <laughs> you have a very big white horse. I have no interest in horses, but I do have interest in something big and white of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Your canines. Come on, let me give them a pet. Then he starts towards man to man, trying to grab his teeth while he squirts his head away. I wouldn't do that if I were you. My canines are, no more, are more known for their bite than their bark. He bites Dentista's hand. Ouch! You have a dirty mouth. Dentista pulls out a water gun. Prepare to be rinsed out. Dentista <laughs> pumps her gun furiously, ready to shoot at man to man. Remora sneaks up behind her and kicks her, knocking her over. You annoying little Kathy, you'll pay for this. Actually, it's you that'll pay. Sick em, boys! Remora boy helps Dentista up. Man to man puts handcuffs on her and escorts her off stage. Grr! You'll pay for this. In less than a minute, actually, I have a partner in crime who just sort of mysteriously showed up and he man to man returns to roughly some other stage. What was she saying? I didn't catch all that. Nonsense and more nonsense, my boy. Nonsense and more nonsense. Thank you both so much. Because of you, the city of Grandsville is once again free of crime. That idea sure excites me. It's as delicious as ice cream. Actually, that reminds me. I have three coupons for the jolly part. If we can find a vendor, we can all get ice cream free of charge. You would do that, Mayor Hinklage? Oh gosh, oh man, that sounds great. <laughs> all of your celebrating's pretty pathetic. What? Who said that? Whoever you are, you should turn that frown upside down. Grandsville's no place for Debbie Downers. Enter Sid. Ten years ago, I died at the hands of my former best friend. I was then transported to the depths of hell and was granted by the great Lord Satan himself. He told me he'd grant me one wish, and my wish was to return to Earth, to get back to my wife and son. Oh, do they live here? <laughs> Are you looking for them? I'm the mayor here. I can probably help you find them. I discovered my wife was married to my murderer, who was abusing both her and my boy. <clears throat> I tried to protect them, but they did not recognize me. So they beat me up and tossed me out, telling me to never return again. Well, that's sad. Uh, I'm not really sure what it has to do with- The anger inside me gave me superhuman abilities. I changed my name to Singe, to represent the inner burning of my heart. Well, thanks for sharing your story and all, but I still don't know what you're doing here. Tell me. Would you rob a bank to be able to feed a starving world? Well, no. As mayor, it's my job to make sure that the law is upheld. And it's my job as a superhero to beat up those who don't get that. And I help you! <laughs> <laughs> Superheroes. You think that you're all so good and pure, saving the world and whatnot, but it's really the world that's evil. I seek to change the Earth. I'm ambivalent and good to good and evil, as you know it. So I'm still confused as to what exactly you want from us. I have no need for you. Excuse me. Singe walks towards the great regional bank while the others stand idly by. Well, that was certainly unusual. Wait a minute, man to man. Didn't that Singe guy say something about robbing a bank? But I told you, right? Hurry, no more, boy. We have to stop him. Man to man and more, boy, run in front of, run in front of Singe. You're not getting away easy, Singe. Foolish mortals. You have no idea who you're dealing with. Actually, you kind of told us your entire life story, so I say we do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do this, but I guess I have no other choice. Face the flames of hell! Singe points his hands at Manta Man and Remora Boy as if to shoot fire at them. The heroes are paralyzed and in pain. Manta rays are marine wildlife! Fire is the opposite of what we need! <laughs> I'll keep feeding up your parasites until the end, man to man, even if I die in the process. Joan stares at the event in shock while the heroes suffer more and more. Eventually, Joan gets fed up with this and lashes out. Enough! 
Sinji is caught off guard and stops bringing the heroes to turn around and face Joan. You say that the world is evil and that you want to change it, and yet you seek to destroy innocent people. Can you not see the hypocrisy in your methods? No one is innocent. Everyone has sins which must be purged. Well, sure, I might have stolen a toy car when I was four years old, but everybody makes mistakes now and then. I was punished at the time, and I learned from it. Why should I have to be punished again? Remor, boy, and I are just like you. We seek to fight for justice. Why, just today we prevented an evil seductress named Tintista from robbing this very bank to buy a giant dentist grill to dig through the earth. We beat her up real good. <laughs> <laughs> so you would beat a young woman to prevent her from doing her job, but you wouldn't rob a bank to feed a starving world? Well, to be fair, she started. <laughs> Listen, Sinch, you've made some good points, but you really ought to have more sympathy for those around you. Sympathy is for the weak of heart. And you're especially weak of heart. You even said that you changed your name because you felt like it had been burnt. You purge people of their sins by burning them to death, but having experienced death yourself, don't you think it's pretty terrible? Yes. I have come face to face with the horrors of death, and that is precisely why I do it. I want others to suffer <coughs> just as I have. But we had nothing to do with your suffering. Yeah, why should we have to suffer for something that your best friend did ten years ago? It wasn't his fault. His soul was corrupted by the horrors of this world. The horrors of the world are corrupted too, and whatever corrupted those were corrupted by something else, and so on and so forth. All that you're doing is perpetuating the chain. If you really want to change the world, you need to break it. The chain binds us all. We cannot escape. It might seem tough, but it's not impossible. What if I have to find your ex-wife and explain the situation to her? I get her husband arrested, and I get the bank and other businesses to donate to charity. How would that make you feel? I would feel relieved, but it would not satisfy the needs of the men. When I hear about superheroes who watch over big cities like Chicago or Detroit, I think to myself, wow, they have serious work on their hands. I could never do what they do. Sometimes I cry because I think I'll never be as good as them. Sure does. I have to wipe his nose sometimes. <laughs> but when I think back to all of the smiling civilian faces I see when I stop a train crash or a bank robbery and I realize that I have plenty to be proud of. You don't have to save everyone. Just save who you can. Huh. Well, that's very deep and meaningful and all. But how is that supposed to sell comic books? <laughs> what? <laughs> Kids want hyper-violence, moral ambiguity, demons, death, and despair in their comic books. There's no room for cheesy, good-natured, gobbledy gook like you guys in today's world. What? No! Kids want cheesy catchphrases, colorful costumes, puns, sidekicks, and banter in their comic books. Where on earth are you getting your information? He's not getting it from Earth at all, man to man. He's from hell, remember? That's where he's getting his information. <laughs> Singe, what year do you think it is? It's the dark, grungy year of 1996. Oh, preposterous! This is an idealized portrayal of the moderately sexist year in American history, 1966. <laughs> you have a female mayor, though. Huh. I guess that I must have discovered a time rift when I was visiting those ancient-ass tech rooms. I think I'll slumber in hell for a few decades. All right, you do that, then. I feel like I should have learned something through all that, man to man. What should I have learned? From our boy, this is a turning point in our careers. We will continue to fight crime, but we might need to take a break to reflect on everything we've been through so far. Think of it as an intermission in a series of vignettes, all sharing a common theme. Wow, man to man, that's metaphorific. It sure is, from our boy. Enter ice cream. Ice cream, get your ice cream here. Well, no time to lean on the fourth wall. Duty calls. <laughs> delicious, delicious duty. Blackout. <laughs> it's a show called Wizard's Keep, and it's just sort of a general fantasy parody, so enjoy. Dumdolph, age 70, a grand wizard serving as a mentor for the Wizard Guild. He often gets caught up in delivering an exposition. Blanket, <laughs> age 23, an enchanted archer who believes himself to be the true leader of the guild. Hates waiting. Gimstrom, age 35. A wizard warrior, relying on physical strength more than magic. Kind, but dumb. Helen, <laughs> age 19. A support wizard, who feels shut off from the rest of the guild. Actually a witch in disguise. Fire, age 1000. A mighty dragon with her own castle. 
Snorky and Duke Electric. Zinalda, age 23, the princess of the Wizard Kingdom, really seriously ought to be important. Takes place in the 15th century in a faraway land known as Center Earth. There is nobody on stage except for Dumbdoll. There is but a lone spotlight, spotlight on him. Ten thousand years ago, a demon descended onto Center Earth. It destroyed village after village, decimating thousands in the process. The people lived in fear, and there seemed to be no hope for a better future. Until a council of four brave wizards was forced to bring its reign of terror to an end. The wizards fought hard to slay the beast, but ultimately it was the princess of the wizard kingdom who sealed away the demon, but not before it put a curse on center. All right, Grandpa, we've all heard the story. Now let's get a move on so we can get to the Dragon Fortress before midnight. For silence, but people they must know. <laughs> people? Give strong no see people. Yeah, Dumb Dell, who are you talking to? I don't see anyone. Well, not besides us, anyway. <sighs> all right, all right. Now, I'll hurry it up, but a true wizard must trust not what he sees. Well, what about a true witch? Hey, I beg your pardon? You said a true wizard must trust not what he sees, but can a true witch trust what she sees? Witch? Gimstrop knows the witch. Yeah, I really don't know why you're always asking about witches. Sure, witches are fun to look at and all, but I don't see any around here, do you? Um. Yeah, that's right. Didn't think so. So come on, let's not waste any more time in, with little irrelevant queries. Come on, gang, let's get a move on. That dragon's not going to slay itself. <sighs> okay. The Guild Just so you know, we're the descendants of those old wizards in the legend, and that curse is what allowed a new demon to come to Center Earth. We were all set and ready to go until a dragon kidnapped the current princess, and... Sweet Anglican Church, would you just shut up? I'm starting to regret bringing you along. You're supposed to be wise, but I think you're just senile. Palin, grab the time card. Why do I have to do all the grunt work? I'm more competent than Gimstrong. More competent than Gimstrong? Gimstrong is a valuable member of the Wizard Guild. He can disintegrate obstacles, dig us tunnels, defeat big monsters, test our food for us. <laughs> all your resources, healing spells. Why, I'd say that Gimstrong is more valuable than... Gimstrong rolls in the mud while grunting like a pig. Everyone stops to stare at him. Gimstrong soon realizes he's being criticized. What? And won't they take bath? Give me drum. <laughs> Would you please get the time card? Yes, yes, Palud. <laughs> Give Strong get it for you. Palud smirks at Lincoln, who expresses a sigh of defeat. Give Strong grabs a sign that says several hours later and waves it in front of the audience. He puts it back and soon everyone freezes in place before the lights go down again. The lights go up. We did it! We reached the Dragon Fortress! Oh, your celebration may be in vain. Remember the legends of the ancient past. The name Dragon Fortress bears significance. Listen, Gramps, you really shouldn't worry. I mean, yeah, yeah, there may be a dragon doll, but come on, man. Our ancestors defeated a demon. Do you really think this a measly dragon is going to stop us? Enter, fire. Who are you calling measly? It's the great mighty dragon, fire! Thanks for the introduction, but I'd like to think that my well-kept fangs and ravishing scales speak for themselves. <laughs> anyway, what is a band of buffoons like you doing here? Don't play dumb. You've got our princess and we're here to rescue her. We are the Wizard Guild, direct descendants of those who sealed away the great demon of Voldenon long ago. Well, that is certainly some guild you've got there. Let's see, you've got a hothead, an ancient, a fool, and someone else. Oh, and you're all white males. Ancestors of the old Wizard Guild or not, I don't think it would kill you to have a little diversity, would it? <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Oh, thank you, Fire. I've been trying to tell them this the whole time, but they won't What, me. you? You're by far the least interesting of the guild members. I... Fire stares down Fallon, who proceeds to sigh. Now, you claim that Zonalda is your princess, but does she not watch over the whole kingdom? Does that not include my fortress? The princess willingly watches over the wizard kingdom and serves to protect all wizards. And witches, too. Do not forget about witches. Yes, sir. Right. Listen, Helen. You really should stop using that term. The only W word that you should ever use to describe a female magic user is wonderful, which is love being called wonderful. <laughs> anyway, Zanola protects us willingly as we are her people, but you, monster, you're not even a person. Wow, way to hurt her feelings like this. She's a goddamn scary dragon. 
Should I really care about hurting her feelings? Kim Strong care about her, Tom? Kim Strong runs up to fire and readies his fist. Kim Strong? Pah! Where's Kim Strong? Remember your wizard training, Pah! <laughs> Kim Strong's <laughs> enchanted! <laughs>
Dennis Wade, age 29, a mildly married man who lives alone in a suburban neighborhood and works an office job, doesn't consider himself terribly interesting. Captain Zarius Spork, age 35, a super smart galaxy hopping alien captain who, for whatever reason, decided to camp out in Dennis's neighborhood for a while. Ulaha Shalaka, also known as Ulaha Zarbanink Sinovakov, co pilot of the USS Exit Gift, and also Spork's girlfriend, smart and sassy. Tinkertron, age 0.3, robot <laughs> meant to serve as navigator for the Exit Gift. Since she's just been recently programmed, she acts like a stubborn teenager. Zombie number one, age unknown. Zombie number two, age unknown. Takes place in the far off distant future of 2015. <laughs> Starts off in the suburban neighborhood of Ordinaria before shifting, shifting to the Starship Exit Gift. Dennis and Spork walk on stage from opposite ends to simulate coming out of separate houses. Good morning, Dennis. Good morning, Greg. What have you got going on in your life, neighbor? Well, not really a whole lot. Still working that office job. The boss made me work late last night, which was a bit of a pain, but you know what they say, it's a living. What have you got? What have you been up to, Greg? Oh, you know, normal Earth stuff. Breathing oxygen, drinking water, not having a spaceship, just your typical homo sapien activities. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you have a really weird sense of humor, Greg. But that's a good thing, you know? That's why I like you. I'm super glad you moved here. These past two months have been great for getting to know you. The feeling's mutual. Say, Dennis, are you in any sort of hurry? Oh, not really. I have work in a half an hour, but it's just down the block. I'd probably walk there if I really wanted to. <laughs> All right, go! Because there's been something I've been meaning to tell you. Well, I'd love to hear it. Spork pulls a small electronic device out of his pocket and reads off of the screen. You see, there's a meteor heading towards the Earth, and it brings along with it a deadly virus that... Enter zombies. Brains! God damn it! My communication said that all this would happen tomorrow! Piece of junk! Spork throws the device off stage. All of this? All of what? What's going on? Why are there zombies? How can a meteor carry a virus? Why would you throw out such an expensive piece of equipment? <laughs> There's no time to explain. Come with me if you want to live. Jeez, I sure haven't heard those lines before. <laughs> Dennis and Spork run off stage left. The two zombies look at each other in confusion and shrug before walking off stage right. The zombie picks up a cue card off the ground and shows it to the audience. It reads, later, in a different location. Both zombies then exit and Dennis and Spork return to stage. All right, now that we've made it all the way to this giant metal thing without speaking a word to each other, could you please tell me what the hell is going on? <laughs> Very well. I suppose I should begin by introducing myself. You see, I have not been entirely honest with you. Wait, so you're saying your real name is not actually Gregory Schmegory, but not a big name? <laughs> <laughs> that would be correct. My real name is Zarius Spock, and I am the elite captain of the alien ship, the USS Exit Gift, <laughs> which you are standing in right now. You can't be an alien. You look nothing like an alien. Spork puts on a pair of pointy ears. Oh my god, you're an alien! <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Now, before I get back to what's going on with your home planet, let me add things out a bit by introducing the rest of my crew. Enter Ulaha and Tinkatron. Dennis, this is my co-pilot, Ula Shalalaka, Zabra Comics Novikov. Ula is it a lot of ding dong? <laughs> no, it's Ulahashala. Ulahashala is our next name, Cobb. Wow. Love your name, it's so exotic. <laughs> yeah, well, you can just call me Ulaha, that's easier for you. Isn't she great? She's my girl. <laughs> that's nice. Dennis pauses and then points to Tinker Sean. So who's the little guy? Little guy, you assume that just because I'm a robot you can refer to me as a man like male is a default sex or something? Well, I might have a man's body, but I've been programmed female since day one, and if you can't accept that, then you're just an oppressive bore like the rest of society! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. She gets a little preachy. We only got her out of the box a few months ago, and she has too much angst to reprogram. That's all right, <laughs> I suppose. 
Does she have a name? Well, my brand name is Tinker Turtle, but I don't like the labels that society gives us, especially oppressive big name corporations like Tinker Electronics. <laughs> I prefer to be called Melody Moonlight Sparkles Harmonia. <laughs> I came up with that when I was writing fan fiction. <laughs> you can just call her Tinkertron, if that's easier for you. Well, I suppose I should introduce myself. My name is Dennis. You can just call me Dennis if that's easier for you. Are you sassing me? Maybe just a little? Well, Dennis, I'll have you know that the only reason I say if that's easier for you is because I got a PhD from Archduke Xeviel Academy, and it only took me two and a half years. I am the queen bee around here. Nobody's going to come above me, not even my honey pumpkin, Sarius. You tell him, Poo Poo Bear. So naturally, I assumed you were stupider for me, what with being from Earth and all, but damn, I, did I underestimate you. In order to think you could sass me like that, you'd have to be a whole new degree of stupid, like a new galaxy of stupid. Speaking of which, hey, Sport, what galaxy are you traveling to? Zarla Pod 7, honey. Zarla Pod 7? The hell is Zarla Pod 7? Zarla Pod 7 is known for many things. Flark Fest, running of the Schmalkins, the Zit Zat Factory. Honey, you've got to simplify it for him. He's kind of a gigantic idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose you're right. It would take hours to explain to him what all that means. Okay, so, but none of that really concerns you, does it, Dennis? I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not really sure what any of it means. <laughs> well, that's not important now. What's important is the anti-ore mine located deep within the depths of Zarlapod 7. The anti-ore serves to combat any illnesses caused by meteor impact. Okay, cool. Hey, take a drop. How close are we? We've got like five light years to go. Five light years, that's nothing. Activate warp speed, Tinkertron. Fine. Tinkertron pushes a button and the lights flash for a second. Whoa, I feel like my entire life flashed before my eyes. That's because it did. We used manipulated a, we just manipulated a black hole to take us through time and space 29 years and arrived at Zarbulon 7. That doesn't make any sense. Um, excuse me? Did you get a PhD from Archduke Xeviel Academy? I didn't think so. Trust me, Dennis, I know what I'm talking about. Hey, so are you guys gonna get off the ship now? I really need to finish writing this chapter and I can't do it with all the noise you guys are making. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha no. Take your drum. You expect us to leave without our all-star navigator? Forget about it. Only your built-in GPS can help us find the mines. That is so unfair. It's always been about what's best for you. You never consider my feelings. Actually, this one's about what's best for me. I'm the one whose planet has become infested with zombies. Well, I don't have to listen to you. You're not my real dad. I um, <laughs> never said I was. <laughs> Come on, Tinkertron, let's go. Everyone walks stage left. Tinkertron is dragged by Ulaha. Wait, if I'm getting dragged into this, can I at least be on cue card duty? Well, I suppose. Awesome! <laughs> Everyone exits. Tinkertron enters with a sign that says, Later, on Zarlapod 7. She sets the card down. Dennis enters, carrying a large rock with a spork and Ulaha close behind. Man, that was so crazy how we had to cross the swamp with the giant monster and the laser fight we had to, with those space cowboys and the, the disembodied hands coming from out of the ground and then you got that giant war thing and... Dennis, you can just shut up if that's easier for you. He does have a point, though. There was a lot of crazy stuff that happened. Crazy stuff that the audience is never going to see. <laughs> so, now that we've got the ore, let's head back to Earth. Alrighty then. Take the drum, you know the drill. Press the button and it's warp speed back to Earth. God, you're such a dictator. Take your drum, pushes the button again, and the lights flash. Alright, your supreme highness. Here we are back at this dumpy little planet. Great work, ladies. Now, why don't you two watch over the ship while Dennis and I take care of the zombies? Awesome. Now I can finish this chapter of my fan fiction. Ulaha, I want you to let me know how this sounds. As man to man's body rubbed up against mine, I can see a yoke of chain's heart melting into a bat freshly made fondue. No, don't leave. Let me come along. It was at that moment that I noticed the twinkling eyes of Dr. Robopsychosis that mesmerized my heart like a small dachshund desperately trying to eat a large Honey! Dennis, please! Come to him! Enter zombies. Brains! Oh, well there are zombies now. I guess it's our transition. But I was just getting to the best part. Ulaha drags Tinkertron again. Come on, TT, let's go. 
Let's go. Ula Hunt Jr. trunk exit. Dennis's port entered. Dennis is still holding the oar. Brains. Brains. <laughs> Quickly, Dennis. Drop the anti oar. But won't that break it? Well, yeah, it's time to port. Dennis drops the anti oar on the ground. The zombies are stunned for a second, then they wriggle around a little bit. You know what, Henrietta? We don't need this stuff. <laughs> You're right, Frank. We've got plenty of brains as it is. Let's become lawyers or something! What? That sounds good to me. Zombies walk off. Wasn't that Antidor supposed to transform them back into humans? <laughs> well, they may still look the same as zombies on the outside, but it's what's the inside that's important. Wow. Way to tack a moral on right there at the last minute. Thanks! <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it was great getting to know you. What? You're, you're leaving again? I'm afraid so. I've got one final mission before I retire. Retire? Well, what's after that? I don't know. I might pick up writing or drama, or I could just work at a fast food joint. But the important thing is that I keep my head held high and seek out adventure wherever it may be. Blackout. It is a show called Geek Out, which really isn't based off of any sort of media. It's more based off of how geeks are viewed by society. And it takes place at a high school. Enjoy. Jennifer Carter, age 15, a freshman student with a few friends, is willing to do anything to make friends. Thomas Huff, age 15, a freshman student interested in superheroes, science fiction, and fantasy, considered fairly average by his peers. Madeline Order, age 30, a teacher who grew up in a different time, shows no interest in modern geek culture, but has a great love of 80s cartoons. Branson Huff, age 18, Thomas's brother, a senior quarterback, looks down on people who play video games and read comics. Connie Smith, age 15, Jennifer's friend since middle school, interested in gaming and anime, incredibly shy. Dwayne Burton, a junior student with autism, very vocal about his interests, but has few friends as a result. Other students, <coughs> teachers, generic students who never say or do anything significant, can be played by people who are hard with cutouts. <laughs> takes place in the present day at Hubbard Guidex Senior High. Jennifer, Connie, and Dwayne are out in the hallway. Jennifer, Connie, Jennifer and Connie are on one end talking to each other, whereas Dwayne is way over on the other end playing with a portable gaming system. So guess what, Connie? What? I met a sophomore guy on the baseball team the other day who is totally into man-to-man, -man, electricity, Captain Punch face. Do you know what that means? He likes superheroes. Exactly! He likes superheroes! I like superheroes. We're a perfect fit for each other. I think I'm totally going to marry him. Jenny, there are a lot of people who like superheroes. They're kind of the in thing now. You met this guy, what, like two days ago? On Wednesday. OK, so one day ago. You have one thing in common, and now you want to marry him? You might want to slow down a bit there, Jen. From the information you gave me, it sounds like you don't even know this guy's name. What? Of course I know the guy's name. It's Ra 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 Rodney? Dwayne looks at Connie and Jennifer for a second before focusing back on his game. Disgusting. Disgusting? What is it? Did you step in gum or something? No, it's that weird Dwayne kid. He totally just looked at us. I don't even get what he's doing here. He's probably switched lockers with a freshman just so he can stare at us. Well, actually, there just weren't enough lockers in junior hallway to accommodate all of us. Hey! I wasn't talking to you! Really? Because you said that pretty loud. <laughs> he's right, you know. Anyway, I really don't mind being in freshman hallway. It, it lets me show all the new freshmen my game collection. I've got hundreds in my locker from every console era. I suppose the freshman girl thing is just another perk. <laughs> well, let's get out of here. This guy's a total freak. Come on, Jen. No need to leave. He really doesn't seem all that bad to me. Yeah, well, this is coming from the girl who bought a life-size plus with that guy from the Ninja Cartoon for Babies. Hey, now. Aoko Chan is not for babies. Aoko Chan is awesome. I don't care what you think. Darugo is my soulmate. Oh, I totally agree. Uh, except for the pulp Darugo part. For me, it's Chisame. I would have gone with Babaru, but she seems way too high maintenance. Anyway, what did you think of the whole Dark Particle story? Did you think that Chisame's atomic uh, bounce would. Enter Branson and Thomas. And trying to get some pussy there, eh, Dwayne? Well, actually, I. <laughs> Just Dwayne, 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 my main man. I see the way you're playing, but you're not going to get anywhere with those gay-ass games of yours. <laughs> I don't know. I like games. You do? Oh, that's adorable. Look, Thomas, it's a match made in heaven. 
they're going to have all sorts of little nerd babies crawling around conventions together. That is, if they ever learn what sex is. <laughs> uh, yep, really funny. <laughs> so, what, are you, what about you, sweetheart? You don't associate yourself with these dorks, do you? Who, me? Oh, no. I just have my locker next to this girl. I don't even know her name. All right, girl. What are you into then? Football. Definitely football. Lots and lots of football. You see that, Thomas? That's how you get the ladies. None of that faggot ass wizard shit. They want a real man's man. Right. Sound cue. School bell. Oh shit! I better go. If I'm late again, Miss Jenkins is gonna make me sit at the desk in the corner so I can't chill with my bros. Exit, Francis. <laughs> so, what the hell is that about? Well, that's my brother for you. Francis, your brother? Oh my god, I'm so sorry. No, not that. Why the hell did you pretend not to know me earlier, Jen? That guy was kind of cute. I thought that the rest of you guys were gonna scare him away. You thought he was cute? Is personality not a factor at all for you? Well, Branson's not all bad. <coughs> he calls me buddy and may man a lot. Hmm? I'm sure he's being real sincere. Listen, guys, I know my brother's interesting, but he can actually be really cool. He just hides it because, well, I don't know why, actually. Hmm? I guess he just has an image to uphold. See, Connie? He said he could be really cool. Yeah, let's go ahead and trust the guy we've never met. The name's Thomas. Anyway, don't you think we should be headed to class, too? The bell did ring a while ago. Being punctual is very important. The lights go down. When they come back up again, students and his order. The students are at their desk while Miss Order stands up in front. Again, that's life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, common good, justice, equality, diversity, truth, popular sovereignty, and patriotism. Which value speaks to you the most, class? I can wait here all day. Enter Thomas, who sits in an empty desk. Oh, Mr. Huff! How nice of you to show up. Well, better late than never, I suppose. Did you do your reading? The one on the core democratic values? Yes, Thomas. So you read it then? Yeah. All right, then. Why don't you tell the class which one is your favorite? Probably justice. Whenever I see wrong in the world, I, I try to make it. I try my best to make it right. All right, Thomas, can you give an example of how you see justice in today's society? Well, to be honest, I don't really see it that often around here. People here are just so superficial, it's kind of disgusting. Nobody should be judged simply for liking a certain thing. They should be judged by the content of their hearts, but nobody seems to get that. Not around here, anyway. Now, man to man, he gets it. He now, now, there's no need to point to comic book movies for answers here. I'm sure you can find examples of justice elsewhere if you just look hard enough. Why, back when I was young, man to man couldn't be taken seriously at all. The layers of cheese on that show, I tell you. Well, what about the Guild of Wizards Keep, then? Or, or Captain Sport from, from Comet Crisis? Man, it seems like fictional characters are more just than we'll ever be. Thomas, 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 you can't just relate everything to fiction, you know? This stuff has real world applications. Just look around you. The core democratic values follow you everywhere. Why, in this classroom, there's so much diversity. Sound cue, a bell ring. Huh, short class. Well, see you later, Mrs. O. Exit Thomas and other students, which could require Thomas lifting them out if they are being played by cardboard bags. <laughs> you know, cunts wouldn't seem so short if he didn't show up halfway. Forget it. So all the classics are coming back, huh? That quirky wizard book series now has an Oscar-winning movie. That sci-fi series that isn't Galaxy Fights has revamped and is killing at the box office and man to man. I honestly can't believe that that, of all things, is popular now. Used to be kids like Thomas were looked down upon, but I guess it's all right to like that stuff now. I just wonder when Lennon Ripley will get a reboot. <laughs> well, the classroom is all to myself. Miss Order pulls a television and VCR on stand from offstage, but sits down to watch it, enjoying every minute. Oh, Rigby, what sorts of crazy adventures will you go on next? <laughs> oh, that's a silly question. I already know the episode order. Okay, to black. Open on Dwayne, Thomas, Connie, and Jennifer. I sure am glad today is a little bit. Yeah, Miss Order seemed weirdly pushy today. I didn't quite know what to make of it. Well, I, for one, thought today was great. What did you think about today, Dwayne? No, it was all right, I suppose. Branson, feel the ball by. All right, bro, you ready to bounce? Yeah, I, I think so. You think so? You don't sound too sure. Well, if you don't want to go home, I'll just go ahead and leave without you. Branson starts walking off. Wait, Branson, what's going on? Where are you going? 
Going? I'm going to get crumbed. That's what's going on. Exit, Branson. Well, it's been real, Dick. Dwayne slowly walks away. You're leaving too, Dwayne? Oh, yeah, I've got some homework i got to get done uh, up in the computer lab. Goodbye. Exit, Dwayne. Man, everybody's abandoning me. Well, we're still here. Yeah, I suppose. Let's go down, then come back up on Branson and Dwayne. Branson is sitting at the computer, while Dwayne stands awkwardly behind. Do I want Billy Backwash from the Bakersville Facets, or do I want Jim Repo from the Smashville Villagers? Hey, Branson, uh, what are you doing? Dwayne! Uh, where'd you come from? What are you doing here? Oh, well, I was going to do homework, but I saw you here and I thought I'd see what you were up to. I'm only working on the most manly thing imaginable. Not that you'd understand. Uh-huh. Uh, what do all those numbers mean? Those are my stats for my fantasy football team. See, Patrick Nickback got six points for scoring a touchdown last game, so I think I'm going to replace my current quarterback and put him on the bench. He didn't do too well in the last game. He got minus four, losing two fumbles. Nice. Fantasy football, huh? So you're taking players from different teams and putting them together to form a super team? Yeah, I guess you could say that. Well, sounds a lot like pocket dudes to me. Pocket dudes? Are you serious? Don't kill me with that dirty crap. But no, I'm serious. There are 147 dudes to collect, each with three forms, but you can only use seven of them at a time. Each dude has different stats and abilities, so you want to compare and contrast each dude to form the most balanced team you can and adjust based on your win-loss record. Well, yeah, but where's that going to get you in real life? I can make Mondo Bucks as a football player. There's no money in pocket dudes. Well, not unless you get into the tournaments. Tournament scene? Oh yeah, you can make a lot of money from tournaments. The international championship last year had a $500,000 cash prize for whoever got first place, along with a really large, expensive trophy and a copy of Pocket Dudes Reborn signed by the series creator. Wait, you're not saying fantasy football is for nerds, are you? No, I, I'm just saying it has its similarities to Pocket Dudes. Whether or not that makes it nerdy, well, I guess that's really up to you. Up to me, huh? It's up to me! Come with me, Dwayne. We gotta tell the others. Branson goes racing off. Okay. Dwayne slowly walks off, and the lights go down. We come back up on Jennifer, Connie, and Thomas in the hallway. So, shouldn't your parents have picked you up by now? Actually, we walked here. Oh, well, if my brother ever gets back, you can hitch a ride with us. Branson runs in, super excited, with Dwayne lagging behind. Thomas! You'll never believe what Dwayne just taught! Won't I? I guess it depends on what he taught you. Pocket Tunes is stupid, but so is fantasy football! And so are all the fantasy and space things you like. That's not what I said at all. <laughs> but they're all really smart too. See, I play football, which is all about exercising the body, but I also play fantasy football, which is all about testing the brain. But it's still football. I'm obsessed with football, just like you're obsessed with superheroes. Glasses Girl is obsessed with anime, Miss Moore is obsessed with Older stuff and the cute freshman is obsessed with everything, everyone, and everything. Right, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Point is, we all have a passion for something different, but the fact that we have that passion makes us the same. So, you know what that makes all of us? A bunch of nerds. No, nope. y'all are my bros! Jennifer gives Branson a stern look. And this is, I guess. Now, let's all get crumped together. Hell, we. Hey, who has the car keys here? Everyone except Thomas left. Thomas shrugs to the audience. Blackout. Alright, so that is the last show.